morning. I'm Mary Ann Carter, the acting chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, and the 196th meeting of the National Council on the Arts is now in session. I would like to welcome everyone this morning, council members, our staff, and our hosts here at the Russell Senate Office Building. For the record, council members who are present are arts researcher Bruce Carter from Miami Beach, Florida, attorney, musician, and former member of Congress Paul Hodes from Concord, New Hampshire, slash Kittery, Maine now, urban planning and community policy specialist Maria Rosario Jackson from Los Angeles, California, dancer, choreographer, and teacher Ronnie Ramaswamy from Minneapolis, Minnesota, producer, actor, and writer Diane Rodriguez, also from Los Angeles, California, film industry executive Tom Rothman, also from Los Angeles, California. Calling in by phone this morning are Aaron Dworkin, Lee Greenwood, Charlotte Kessler, Barbara Prey, and Olga Viso. We regret that council members Maria de Leon, Deepa Gupta, and Rick Lowe, and Mas Masumoto are unable to join us this morning. Now, let's get down to business. May I have a motion to approve the minutes of our October council meeting? Is there a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Now we will move to the council members' votes. I would like to invite Tony Chaveau, our deputy chairman for programs and partnerships, to take us through this section of the meeting. Good morning, council members. We'll proceed with the application review section of the agenda. The tally of the votes will be announced at the end of today's session. The council will be voting by ballot today on award recommendations totaling $84.2 million in three funding areas, artworks, state and regional partnerships, and national initiatives. These funding recommendations are found in the corresponding sections of your council book. For the vote to be tallied, you must be present at the time of the motion, discussion, and vote. To the council members joining us by teleconference, you're instructed to email your votes to Kim Jefferson and these three funding categories immediately at the conclusion of this part of the meeting. Council members' affiliations have been recorded in the council book and will be attached to your ballots, and each member has been provided an opportunity to update this information prior to the meeting. Before voting, council members should review the list of recommendations and rejections and add to the list provided in your folders any affiliations that may be missing. Council members are recorded as not voting on applications with which they are affiliated. This list becomes a part of the agency's official record. After brief summaries of the three funding areas, council members will have an opportunity to ask questions and are discuss the recommendations before, before voting uh, by ballot. May I have a motion to consider the recommended grants and rejections under artworks, partnerships, and national initiatives in the council's book? So moved. Is there a second? Thank you. Now I'll summarize the three funding areas on which you will be voting and then pause for any comments or questions from council members. The artworks category is the agency's primary category of funding for the arts disciplines and encourages and supports the creation of art that meets the highest standards of excellence public engagements with diverse and excellent art, lifelong learning in the arts, and the strengthening of communities through the arts. Artworks projects recommended today comprise a second group of artworks applications brought to the council this fiscal year. The first half was considered at the October 2018 meeting. In July 2018, the agency received 1,593 eligible applications requesting more than $76.6 million in fiscal year 2019 support. Recommended for the council's approval are 983 projects totaling up to $24,088,500. Grants are recommended to nearly 62% of all applicants with amounts ranging from $10,000 to $100,000 and an average grant amount of $24,505. 
Recommended projects span 13 disciplines and fields. Direct grants are recommended to 47 states, as well as the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. Are there any comments or questions from the council? If not, please mark your ballot. State, <coughs> state and regional partnership agreements assist the nation's state arts agencies and regional arts organizations in their support for the arts. By law, 40% of arts endowment appropriated program funds are awarded this way. State arts agencies will utilize arts endowment support in combination with state appropriated funding to support arts organizations, schools, and artists in producing the arts projects in communities across the country. This year, a total of $41.8 million is being recommended for the states and $8.7 million for the regionals. Are there any comments or questions from the council? If not, please mark your ballot. National initiatives support a wide variety of projects of national and field-wide significance. At this meeting, the council is requested to approve funding for 10 initiatives totaling $7.9 million. Support is requested for the NEA National Heritage Fellowships, which recognize the recipient's artistic excellence and support their continuing contributions to our nation's traditional arts heritage. The Performing Arts Discovery Initiative, which will assist U.S. regional arts organizations to showcase performing arts groups in their respective regions. USA Artists International, a program that showcases the excellence, diversity, and vitality of American artists and arts organizations at international arts markets around the world, and supports the participation of American artists at other significant cultural events abroad. The Performing Arts Global Exchange, a new program designed to provide broader access to the work of international artists and arts forms less frequently seen outside of major urban centers in the United States. The 2020 class of NEA Jazz, Ma Jazz Masters Fellows. Poetry Out Loud, which encourages the nation's youth to learn about great poetry through memorization, recitation, and performance, and helps students master public speaking skills and learn about their literary heritage. 57 recommended projects in our town, which will help transform American communities into lively, beautiful, and resilient places with the arts at their core. 15 projects in research artworks, which will build evidence about the value and impact of the arts and encourage strong partnerships and exchanges of information among researchers. One NEA research lab, which will provide insights about the arts for the benefit of arts and non-arts sectors alike. And finally, Shakespeare in American Communities, a program that brings professional theater performances and educational activities to students in schools and in the juvenile justice system throughout the country. Are there any comments or questions from the council? If not, please mark your ballot. To our council members joining by teleconference, you may now email your votes to Kim Jefferson on those three categories. Finally, there are two projects in the award update section of the council book. These grants have been awarded under the chairman's delegated authority and are brought to the council's attention at this meeting, but no vote is necessary. Included are 138 Challenge America grants in 41 states and a chairman's extraordinary action award that supported performances of U.S. dance artists and cultural exchange workshops at the 2019 International Federation of Arts Councils and Cultural Agencies World Summit in Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. I would now like to open the floor to our council members to hear some of their reactions to our meetings with NEA-supported projects yesterday. In addition to briefings and updates from our staff, the council members and I had the opportunity to make two site visits to better understand our work. First, we visited Fort Belvoir to learn about the Creative Forces work at the Intrepid Spirit One facility. This represents one of the agency's 11 clinical healing arts therapy locations with the military that can be found across the country. After touring the facility, speaking with the doctors and clinical art therapists, and even, even hearing from patients, 
We then visited Signature Theater in Arlington, Virginia for a discussion with the creative team behind their current production of Masterpieces. Council members, the floor is yours. Paul, since you're so shy, why don't you start? I understand that I'm going to be making some remarks later, and I will just say that uh, yesterday was um, incredibly moving, extraordinarily moving. Um, and uh, visiting Signature Theater uh, was joyful and illuminating. And if the arts do anything, uh, they help us understand the profound movement, movement of the heart and the joy of uh, yeah. I'm always so inspired by the breath, first of all, of all of the grants that are given out. Uh, you know, going through the council book, you're just amazed that every part of the country is being covered, and and you're you're shouting up and, and down because this is really what it's about. And, uh, and, and why I am so uh, wanting to be a part of all of this. It's a wonderful movement. Uh, the, going to, to uh, the creative, to re really see a program that the NEA has sponsored. And in, in my mind, I've been really looking at how we can move our field forward. And the Creative Forces program is certainly one of those. And we saw firsthand how it affects individuals um, and, it, and how healing it is. Uh, you know, I, I fractured my neck this year, last year, and I've been on a healing uh, for six months. And I continued to direct a show and do a workshop, and the notion of creation being, being a healing process, I experienced it firsthand, and I saw it yesterday again, and it was so moving. So thank you for having uh, us go through a wonderful day. Uh, yes, I would uh, second all that. I would also just say that uh, we learned um, yesterday at the hospital how um, integral the NEA's program was to the, to the programs with the DOD and the um, uh, <coughs> um, the, the um, actual uh, genesis and creation of that. And because we spent time yesterday with a, uh, a young captain who had been in a terrible helicopter uh, accident and he was very open and sharing with us and we saw the, the uh, art therapy project that he had done and what a difference it had made in his life and in his family's life, which he talked about as well. And I have to say, I was very proud of the NEA um, because it became very clear from the head physician there and a lot of the occupational therapists that, but for the efforts of the NEA, um, uh, it's not clear that program would exist. So I think that was, that was wonderful. Also yesterday, we did something a little different, uh, which was we were in closer uh, interactive quarters with the directors of the various disciplines at the NEA. Um, and I'd just like to take the opportunity to say that, uh, first of all, I, I enjoyed that interactivity very uh, much. I agree with Diane. It's always um, marvelous to see the breadth of, uh, of um, projects being supported, but it also just gave us a chance to um, uh, uh, interact close up with the very dedicated staff of the NEA uh, who work tirelessly uh, in these endeavors. Indeed, I think for some period of time might actually work without pay as some members of the federal government uh, experienced um, and uh, never flagged and their uh, dedication and, and integrity is, is, is really inspiring. So I just take the chance to thank this, the staff as well. Um, I was very moved uh, watching the art therapy sessions, hearing both the patients as well as the therapists, how the patients had come in with absolute um, emotionless, 
not to use their emotion in their jobs, and then how the therapists using their artistic, um, whether it's music or art, visual art, bringing the, the emotions back to the patients and to hear them talk about their experience, being so emotional, I, it moved me a lot. I am a practicing artist, and to watch that happen, I think everybody should know about this and um, really support this whole endeavor by the any. And Maria was unable to join us yesterday, but I will open the floor if you'd like to say anything. Um, I wasn't able to join the site visit, sadly, yesterday, but I've been following uh, the work for a number of years. Um, and I think the thing that, that gets my attention and is so inspiring, in addition to the work itself, is the possibility of what implications it may have outside of clinical settings. Um, how to go from that kind of um, extraordinary success in a clinical setting and to begin to ask, how might this look outside of that? Uh, what can it mean for everyday lived experience in American communities? Uh, I, I just think that it's a kernel um, of, of uh, something that's really special and powerful. Okay, now um, I will give some updates uh, today, um, but really what I'm gonna talk about is the importance of the National Endowment for the Arts. And excuse me if I'm a little bleary-eyed, a few of us returned last week from Southeast Asia. The National Endowment for the Arts, as Tony said, represented the United States at the International Federation of Arts Councils and Culture Agencies, known as IPICA. While there, we took the opportunity to host the 400 plus guests representing 81 countries in a show of cultural diplomacy. In a collaboration between the National Endowment for the Arts, the Department of State and Arts Envoy, as well as the U.S. Embassy in Kuala Lumpur, we held a reception for all IFACA participants at the National Gallery of Art in Kuala Lumpur, along with a breathtaking performance by U.S. vertical dance group Bandaloo. To make the night even more special, Andaloop teamed up with a local dance company in Kuala Lumpur who performed with them. It was magical. I think we have a very short clip from the performance. <laughs> I will just say that clip does not do any justice to the actual <laughs> event because it was truly amazing. Additionally, we attended meetings with our U.S. embassies in Japan and Singapore. And so I would also like to extend a heartfelt thank you to our colleagues at the Department of State and we hope for future collaborations with them. I began working at the National Endowment for the Arts in January 2017. One of the first things I did was begin to absorb the history and the milestones of the agency. Imagine my surprise in discovering that our budget in 2017 was almost the exact same as it was 40 years earlier. A 40-year-old budget, no adjustment for inflation, and 100 million more people in the country. With an unchanged budget and an ever-expanding population, the National Endowment for the Arts has created remarkably effective programs that blanket the nation, reaching citizens not only in all 50 states, but in all 435 congressional districts. With slight increases from Congress the past two years, our current budget is $155 million. I have discovered since my time here that far too few people across the country and including many within government, have no idea what we do. I'd like to take the opportunity today to discuss who we are, what we do, and clear up some outdated myths. 
First and foremost, we are a grant-making agency. More than 80% of the arts endowment funding is distributed as grants and awards across the nation. We focus a lot on the national or the nation in our name, making sure we award grants to every corner of the country and as I stated earlier, in every one of the 435 congressional districts. A recent examination of our direct grants shows that the majority go to small and medium-sized organizations, which tend to support projects that benefit audiences that otherwise might not have access to arts programming. One third of our direct grants go to small-sized organizations, those with budgets of less than 500,000. Another third goes to medium-sized organizations, and the last third go to larger organizations. A significant percentage of grants go to those who have few, if any, opportunities to participate in the arts. 40% of NEA-supported activities take place in high-poverty neighborhoods. 36% of our grants go to organizations that reach underserved populations, such as veterans, people with disabilities, and people in institutions. I often hear, oh, your agency funds elitists. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example of some of those so-called elitists that we fund. Family Theater. Based in Denver, Colorado, Family Theater was founded 30 years ago and exclusively features performers with all natures of disability, cognitive, emotional, intellectual, physical. Most recently, the National Endowment for the Arts supported a production of Into the Woods, featuring a cast of actors with disabilities. The performance run included a sensory-friendly performance for audiences with autism or sensory integration disorders. The Paper Mill Playhouse, located in Milburn, New Jersey, the Paper Mill Playhouse is dedicated to not only advancing the art form of musical theater, but also provides access for all. Most recently, they received arts endowment support for a series of theater programs that serve the needs of children with autism and other social and cognitive disabilities. Time Slips, based in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, engages older adults with cognitive impairment and memory loss through creative storytelling. Most recently, they received support from the National Endowment for the Arts for performances of new works created during artist residencies in rural nursing homes throughout Kentucky. <clears throat> Never once in my life have I ever heard anyone in those categories that I just mentioned can be considered elitists. And through the years, the agency has broadened its reach. We are the arts endowment for a new generation. While still supporting what one would think of as an arts grantee, we have also branched out into new exciting aspects of arts culture. No program embodies this more than Creative Forces, our military healing arts network, which we have discussed earlier today and which we saw live in action yesterday. Creative Forces is a partnership of the National Endowment for the Arts, the Departments of Defense and Veterans Affairs, and the state and local art agencies that serve the special needs of military patients and veterans with traumatic brain injury and psychological health conditions, as well as their families and caregivers. The program places creative arts therapies at the core of patient-centered care at 11 clinical sites throughout the country, plus a telehealth program, and increases access to community arts activities to promote health, wellness, and quality of life for military service members, veterans, their families, and caregivers. Outstanding administrative support for Creative Forces is provided by Americans for the Arts. We are in the process of expanding this, this critical healing arts work to other treatment populations, like pediatric oncology patients and those affected by, the, by opioid addiction. In fact, we recently participated in a meeting with the First Lady on her Be Best campaign and dealing with the opioid crisis. 
and we have expanded the incredibly successful Shakespeare in American Communities program to include opportunities for theater companies to partner with the juvenile justice system to engage youth within that population with the works of Shakespeare. Evidence has shown that these programs provide positive rehabilitative outcomes and prevention for youth involved in the juvenile justice system. These programs have also been shown to help reduce recidivism rates. Economic impact. For over five years, the National Endowment for the Arts has been partnering with the Bureau of Economic Analysis at the Department of Commerce to measure the size and impact of arts and culture on the U.S. economy. The most recent numbers revealed arts and culture is 4.3% of GDP, or 804.2 billion. That's greater than the value added to the GDP from construction or agriculture or transportation and warehousing combined. Investing in the National Endowment for the Arts continues to yield one of the greatest rates of return for the American taxpayer. Arts endowment grants produce a significant return on investment of federal dollars, with $1 of our direct funding leveraging up to $9 in private and other public funds. The end result, over $500 million in matching support on top of our initial investment. And at a time when our nation faces growing trade imbalances, arts and cultural production stand out, actually providing a trade surplus of $25 billion. But this should come as no surprise. American art and culture has long been one of our country's most valuable assets. From pioneering musicals like Oklahoma and Carousel, to the jazz standards of Count Basie, to early rockers like Buddy Holly, Chuck Berry, and Elvis Presley, American art has carved out a unique place in the cultural fabric of the world. And the Arts Endowment, the National Endowment for the Arts, is the primary federal agency committed to celebrating America's creativity and cultural heritage. Just as American culture gave birth to the musical a century ago, the National Endowment for the Arts provided early workshop support to the groundbreaking Hamilton. Preserving and promoting new works of one of America's unique art contributions to the world, musical theater. Another example of honoring our heritage, the National Endowment for the Arts helped fund a site study and assisted with the design competition for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial which has provided millions of visitors with a place to grieve and reflect. I want to highlight something of an untold success story at the National Endowment for the Arts. That is, the Arts Endowment is one of the best examples of conservative government. That may seem odd, sure it sounds odd, as a few conservatives have challenged the endowment in the past. But the reforms that conservative lawmakers spearheaded in the mid-1990s ushered in an era of unrivaled good governance at the agency. Never a federal behemoth, the trimmed-down National Endowment for the Arts has found immense success in its ability to be small, nimble, and flexible. This has allowed the agency to be responsive to changing needs, adaptable to matching up with suitable partners, and mission-focused as an agency, which devotes 80% of its resources to grants and awards. The small nature of the agency has also reaped benefits by allowing the agency to be accountable, transparent, and an excellent steward of taxpayer dollars. To that point, the National Endowment for the Arts has had 16 consecutive clean financial statement audits. Another reform implemented in the mid-1990s, project-based funding. The agency does not fund individual artists. We fund projects at nonprofits. This has aided in the agency's quest for transparency. Project-based funding has also produced another benefit. It has kept the agency laser-focused on its mission year in and year out. It affords staff, 
panelists, and council members the ability to hone in on a project, assess its excellence and merit, and make funding decisions based on specific descriptions. This allows the agency to focus its limited resources on areas that have the most impact and benefit to a grantee's community and in turn get the most bang for the buck for the American taxpayer. By law, 40% of the arts endowment grant making budget is awarded to state art agencies and regional art organizations, thus allowing federal dollars to reach millions of more people in American communities. We also designate that a portion of every state and regional partnership grant be allocated to underserved communities. In other words, much of the funding decisions are being made at the state and local level. The remaining grant funds left at the federal level are not made by so-called government bureaucrats. Every year, we convene approximately 100 panels, each made up of six American citizens from all regions of the country, all art disciplines, and inclusive of all ethnicities, who make funding recommendations to the agency. We strive to be truly representative of this great nation. The National Endowment for the Arts also is one of the most aggressive federal agencies in seeking out and implementing public-private partnerships. Some of the agency's largest and most successful programs stem from these public-private partnerships. They include the Mayor's Institute on City Design, a partnership of the National Endowment for the Arts in the U.S. Conference of Mayors, which convenes mayors and design experts to solve the most critical planning and design challenges facing their cities. The eminently popular Blue Star Museums, now celebrating its 10th summer, a program that partners us with Blue Star families and the Department of Defense in more than 2,000 museums in all 50 states, which offer free admission to active duty military personnel and their families during the summer. And Poetry Out Loud, a partnership with the Poetry Foundation and state art agencies that encourages high school students to recite and perform great poems, empowering them to develop self-confidence and preparing them for adulthood. Small and flexible, 80% of funding goes to actual grants and awards, transparent, 16 consecutive clean audits, state and local decision making, public-private partnerships, American citizens making funding recommendations. That sounds pretty conservative to me. Being so mission focused also affords the agency one of its greatest benefits and perhaps its greatest benefit, an exceptional and dedicated staff. We have many folks working at the National Endowment for the Arts who are talented artists in their own right and practice and celebrate their gifts outside the office. While some agencies have softball teams, including many of the Senate offices here in this building, competing on the National Mall, I restarted a long dormant endowment tradition of holding a staff talent showcase. Once a year, staff are free to display their art, perform, and celebrate each other. It is truly a remarkable and inspiring day. While this is an excellent morale booster each year, this dedication to the mission by our staff has tangible business results as well. Surveys at the National Endowment for the Arts routinely put workplace satisfaction at over 80%, a truly excellent mark in government. And when people contact the National Endowment for the Arts, our staff exemplify excellent customer service. People are honestly shocked when they call the federal government, our agency, and get a real person on the other end of the phone. Our staff holds webinars, conducts grant workshops, and provides technical assistance to any applicant that seeks it. Perhaps the greatest asset in our good government repertory is our accessibility. Our staff is here for you and will be here for you. And through our work and the strong bi bipartisan support we, sh we share, uh, or that Congress gives us actually, the National Endowment for the Arts will continue to support and preserve American creativity and culture. 
Lastly, I want to address the public-private dollar debate. Despite our vast research across the nation, there are some who argue private dollars can replace public dollars. It's a valid argument, and one I completely understand. I just happen to disagree with it. The Arts Endowment was never meant to replace private arts patronage. Rather, the National Endowment for the Arts was meant to help our arts and culture sector preserve, grow, thrive, and be that beacon of exceptionalism to the rest of the world. While the arts would continue to thrive in our biggest urban centers, access to the arts would evaporate in many other parts of the country, if not for the National Endowment for the Arts. For every county in America that has a high school, the National Endowment for the Arts is there, either through our Poetry Out Loud competition or our Musical Theater Songwriting Challenge. The same cannot be said for private foundations. A review of the art giving of the top 1,000, yes, 1,000 private foundations shows that those private dollars that don't reach 65% of American counties. In contrast, the National Endowment for the Arts is in 779 more counties than private foundations. 779 counties, 25% of America, where the National Endowment for the Arts provides funding, but the top 1,000 private foundations do not. A few examples. In Kentucky, there are 59 counties that receive funding from us that have no private dollars out of 120 counties. In Alabama, 40. In South Carolina, 10. Alaska, 8. And in my home state of Tennessee, 21 counties with our funding, but no funding from the top 1,000 private foundations. Access to arts funding should not depend on one's proximity to private philanthropy. This is what makes the support of the National Endowment for the Arts indispensable. Thank you, and that concludes my remarks. The Joy in Aiken, uh, South Carolina. Aiken County is one of those places that I just talked about. Rich in history, rich in people, and a place where the National Endowment for the Arts funding is crucial to the arts and cultural landscape. Janice is a summa cum laude graduate of Duke University. She has served as a senior advisor on education policy, children's welfare issues, and cultural affairs to a member of Congress, a university president, and a governor of South Carolina. She has also served as executive director of the Child Advocacy Center of Aiken County, which provides critical services to abused and neglected children. She has directed Joy in Aiken since 2014 for her work in education and arts policy at the state level, she is a recipient of the Order of the Palmetto, South Carolina's highest civilian honor. Welcome, Janice. Thank you, Madam Chairman and members of the council and staff of the council for the invitation to appear here today. I'm um, very excited to tell you a little bit about Joy and Aiken, which has been funded by the NEA for the last three years. It's a real honor and privilege for me to be here. Joy and Aiken is a small nonprofit organization in one of those corners of the country that the chairman was talking about. Um, we have one full-time employee in the person of myself and a big mission, which is to try to provide the widest possible access to high quality arts experiences to as many people in our area as possible. We also have a very strong and unique connection to the Juilliard School in New York. Wayne Aiken was founded in 2008 by our president, Sandra Field, and two Pulitzer Prize winning authors who had lived in New York but moved to Aiken in 1989. Um, Greg Smith, 
who, in addition to being an author, was also a very accomplished musician, and Steve Nafee, who is a, a very accomplished sculptor. Um, all three were committed to the idea that the arts can um, be a transforming force in people's lives. Greg and Steve had ties to Juilliard, and when they found with Sandra that the school shared their vision and their ideals for its artists, our festival and outreach program was born. Today, Joy and Aiken is a community-wide, one-of-a-kind affiliation with that world-renowned conservatory. We take our name from Joy Cottage, it's Joy with an E, J-O-Y-E, which is a spectacular 60-room Gilded Age mansion in Aiken that Greg and Steve bought and renovated and which we consider our artistic home. In the last 11 years, we've brought some 450 artists, primarily Juilliard students, faculty, and alumni to Aiken for public performances and outreach. To date, our artists have presented over 100 public performances at over 200 outreach events for some 33,000 33, students. We have just concluded our 11th festival and outreach program, the largest one we've ever had. We had 67 artists and 13 accompanying staff in Aiken. The program was very diverse and we were especially delighted that we had Juilliard Opera this time in a production that they brought only to three cities in the world this year. The first two were London and Versailles. The third is Aiken, South Carolina. <laughs> in 2016, we were awarded South Carolina's highest, highest honor in the arts for our outreach program. As I mentioned, outreach to students is the largest component of our program. And to understand a little bit more about why it's so important, I think you have to understand the history and geography of our part of South Carolina. The city of Aiken is now an equestrian center and a retirement and golf center with a population of about 30,000 30, people. But in the late 19th century and up to World War II, in fact, it was an international center of high society in the arts. The very wealthiest families in the country, the Vanderbilts, the Whitneys, the Rockefellers, the Corcorans of DC fame, the Astors, all of these people wintered in Aiken. They built enormous mansions there and they brought the most celebrated artists of their day to perform for their families and friends. That kind of vast wealth is now, of course, gone. But the city of Aiken is still an island of relative affluence and cultural opportunity in a county that is otherwise main, mainly rural and that faces very significant challenges. The county is largely agricultural, the, with widely dispersed and isolated small towns that had their origin as mill villages. Large swaths of it are economically depressed since the slow decline of the textile industry and its final collapse in the early 2000s. It's a county that's struggling to upgrade its education system in a state where the Constitution re requires only minimally adequate funding. And it's adjacent to some of the poorest counties in the country where an economy that was originally based on cotton cultivation and slave labor left a heavily minority population with almost no industry, no history, and no prospects of decent public education and extremely high unemployment. So what I think is interesting about our story is that we are now in a position to, to close that historical loop. Just as those very wealthy families did in the 19th and early 20th century, we are bringing some of the world's most accomplished artists to Aiken. But this time we're making them available to the whole community and not just to its most privileged members. To provide that kind of access, we have many free events. We keep our ticket prices as low as we can possibly afford. And of course, our outreach events are free with transportation for the students paid for by Joy and Aiken. We serve a very broad cross-section of the population through our uh, festival because of our emphasis on providing access to as many people as possible. But through the outreach program, we also maintain a special focus on the underserved and the disadvantaged. We've taken our artists to some extremely isolated places in Aiken County and surrounding counties in those neighborhoods, there are too many kids who leave school without ever, ever having been in an auditorium or ever having seen a live performance. So when our artists come, the kids really do regard them as rock stars. And for those kids to be taught and mentored and inspired by these Juilliard artists, who are mainly young, 
can be a very profound experience. They learn lessons not only about performance skills, but about discipline and per perseverance and aspiration, which is not always a part of their daily lives. And it can be profoundly meaningful for their teachers as well. So I, I want to show you a video that depicts a week-long residency that we had with a trio of our Juilliard-trained artists in LBC Middle School, which is uh, located on the edge of a former mill village in an extremely depressed neighborhood. The trio taught there for two hours a day and then presented a concert with the students at the end of that time. staff to Aiken. This year we had 80 of them. The answer is always with difficulty. We're a small community, so our donor base is small. We receive no financial support from Juilliard, though they are enormously helpful, of course, in other ways. Our corporate support comes mainly from small local businesses, and it's a relatively insignificant part of our budget. So grants are disproportionately important to us in our roughly $350,000 annual budget. But there are only a handful of statewide or regional funding sources that we can turn to. So we're working every year without very much of a safety net. For all of those reasons, the funding that we receive from the NEA, which has been a community engagement grant in 2016 and Challenge America grants in 2017 and 2018, makes a very real and very tangible difference to us. But I wanted to emphasize that it makes an, a, a difference in less tangible ways as well. Because we're a small organization in a small town in a county where the population is dispersed, it's really important for us as a community to feel that we're part of something larger than ourselves. It helps to know that Juilliard feels that what we do is important. It helps to know that what we are working so hard to accomplish has been validated by the NEA staff and by this council. When Juilliard was in Aiken for the festival just two weeks ago, they paid us the compliment of saying that they consider us a model for the nation, not only in terms of the quality of our productions, but because of the level of our community engagement. We're working hard to promote that spirit of community. This year, for example, Joy in Aiken held its first Mardi Gras jazz parade and its first community fish fry which was um, at a historically African-American church. 
both had very high levels of participation and we felt that they were both very successful in terms of bringing different elements of the community together. That as we continue to seek new ways to provide access and to engage people in shared experiences around the arts, we're thrilled to think that the goals that we are meeting are also, that we're also contributing to goals that are held at the national level. The kids who, um, who were in the LBC residency all wrote letters afterward. The letters are heartbreaking in the way they talk about their experience with the artists as a ray of light and hope in what are otherwise often pretty difficult and disorganized and painful lives. I always try to keep in mind the words of the student who said, we needed somebody to come and tell us that we can do this and that they believe in us. In everything we do, we're trying to tell these kids and their families, no matter where they live, no matter what their, their home lives are like, no matter what their other circumstances are, that we believe in them. With the support of the NEA, we're able to tell them that there are others who believe in them too. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. Are there any questions from council members for Janice? I don't have a question, but I, I just want to congratulate you on uh, on being a, a center and a beacon in, in your community and, and the fact that you've really turned the legacy of what the town was into something that is positive and inclusive. And uh, we really need more organizations like you. And I'm glad that you have the support of Juilliard and certainly of the NEA. We're very proud of that. Uh, and uh, I wish you much success. It's a, it's a difficult road, I hear you. Difficult road. Yes, thank you. So before we get to our second presentation, um, I'm going to turn the mic over to Paul. Uh, there are currently four new council members awaiting Senate confirmation. Um, and they've been there a while, um, but assuming they get confirmed before our next council meeting, both Paul and Maria um, will, will be replaced on the council by these new members. And um, although Paul and I joked in October, I said, oh, I'll see you in March. He said, no, probably not. And I said, well, no, I think I probably will. And, <laughs> and so, um, uh, so, and Maria will speak later, but I wanted to give them an opportunity in case this is their last council meeting to talk about and reflect on their time on the council. So, Paul. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, my <coughs> fellow councilors, staff, friends, um, good morning. Um, so this might be my swan song. Uh, I am hardly a swan, and I'm not going to sing. Um, and by the way, swans, the swan song is a total myth. Um, Socrates uh, coined it, uh, saying that uh, swans sing most beautifully before they die. Um, uh, it has come to mean a, a performance before retirement. Um, Shakespeare said, um, let music sound while we doth the uh, while he doth make his final choice, then if he lose, he makes a swan-like end fading in music. So he bought the myth, um, and uh, this may be my swan song. I have I joined uh, the council somewhere back in the mists of time. Uh, I think it was 2012. So it's been a seven-year run before the curtain falls. And what a time it has been, uh, both on the council and um, in our history as Americans. Um, one of the extraordinary things, having now served under and with three chairs, um, is the way that the agency has maintained its strength continuity and growth under all three chairs. And I know, Marianne, that when your final appointment is made, you will continue in that 
tradition. It's clear from your remarks today how deeply you feel uh, and how extraordinary your leadership will be for this agency. And for that, I am personally and the nation is grateful. Thank you very much. I've had the honor of serving with the most extraordinary group of artists uh, as fellow counselors. Uh, I am humbled continually every time we get together to hear about the extraordinary exploits uh, of the council. Many of you do not get to hear uh, what, what the uh, counselors report uh, when, we come, when we come together, but the breadth and depth of experience, the passion and dedication to the arts is really extraordinary. Um, and of course, there are the directors and the staff. Um, it goes without saying, I think, although why not say it, that the staff of this agency, this agency, does the most extraordinary things. We ought to be called bang for the buck. Um, and it goes beyond the financial implications of what we do with too few dollars. I came, in, I came into the council uh, full of spit and vinegar, sputtering about the funding uh, for the National Endowment for the Arts, and I will leave sputtering about the funding for the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, uh, and that's okay, because as an arts advocate um, outside of these halls, um, I have a lot to say. Um, you know, I, this is a moment of personal privilege, as we used to say in Congress. So when I asked Mike Griffin what I ought to talk about, he said, we trust you. The only mistake he's ever made. Um, in 1957, um, my grandparents bought me a front row ticket uh, to see the music man on Broadway. And I sat there as a youngster, my mouth agape at the spectacle on stage, and I knew where my life needed to go. I knew um, what I needed to do, and uh, so I have worked as a, an actor, a director, a producer, a playwright, a, an opera lyricist, um, a singer, songwriter, guitarist, state arts counselor, board chair, for arts institutions, um, and of course a member of Congress, because that's where it led me, uh, directly from the music man to uh, the halls of Congress. And I will say that my service on the National Council on the Arts um, was actually, uh, has actually been um, the government gig that uh, has moved me the most. Uh, it has been an extraordinary honor to serve as a national counselor on the arts. Um, the implications of the council's work uh, are reflected in my home state in New Hampshire, where for the first time in decades, the governor actually increased substantially the budget for the state arts council. And that is due to the work of the National Endowment on the Arts and the ammunition we had to go to the legislators and go to the governor and show why in the creative economy in the 21st century, the arts are the indispensable party at the table uh, for a workforce that is skilled, for a workforce uh, that understands how to work collaboratively, for a workforce that is suitable to the challenges we face in creating essentially uh, what will have to be a new economy if we are to move forward as a nation um, and uh, support the people of this country. So that's been a direct, direct result of the work at the National Endowment on the Arts. Um, I want to wax philosophical for a moment, if you'll permit me. I think, I believe to my core that the arts are sacred. As the first chairman of the Capital Center for the Arts in Concord, New Hampshire, I was allowed to put a brick in the walkway. And my brick said, the arts illuminate the beauty of the soul. Because the arts connect us to the creative force of the universe. It's a direct connection 
we are each channels through the arts to that light from above that we who practice the arts and work in the arts can channel through us to enlighten the world. And in a time when the American spirit has been bruised, when confidence in our institutions is at a low ebb, when people see a government which does not function effectively as the people would wish, the National Endowment for the Arts stands out as an example of all that is good about what the government can do for the people of this country. It stands out as the example of government of the people, by the people, for the people, that is working for the people with a passion and commitment to public service and the highest aspirations of what government should be for the people of this country. And the implications are profound and practical. Yesterday, visiting the Intrepid Spirit Center, a small group stood in a small room. A helicopter pilot who had survived a devastating crash that killed his tailman showed us the work of art he had created with an arts therapist. He was moved to tears. We were moved to tears. The implications are profound and very practical. The arts transform lives. The arts transform lives like nothing else can. So, as I perhaps leave you. <laughs> At least I won't be back in these halls as a, as a counselor again. As I leave you, I, I celebrate your work. I celebrate my counselors. I celebrate the staff of this agency. Thank you for what you do. Thank you, thank you, and thank you for what you do. Thank you for those whose work in the arts against odds and challenges continues and persists because we are answering to a higher purpose and a higher calling. That's pretty terrific. Thank you very much. It's no surprise he used to be a member of Congress, is it? <laughs> thank you, Paul. That, that was really, really terrific, and thank you. So um, I'm going to introduce our next presentation. Last June, the Arts Endowment did something it hadn't done in nearly 30 years. Hosted a meeting of the National Council on the Arts outside of DC. It was in Charleston, West Virginia. This year, we are looking to build on that momentum and will convene our June meeting in Detroit, Michigan. Here, to give us a preview of what we will experience in Detroit are Omari Rush and Allison Watson. Omari Rush has engaged the arts as both a passion and profession, and in each realm, he continues to enjoy discovery and deepening impacts. As Executive Director of Culture Source in Detroit, and as the governor appointed chairman of the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs, he advances efforts to have creative and cultural expression thrive in diverse communities. Complementing that work, Omari is a board member of Arts Midwest in Minneapolis, the National Assembly of State Arts Agencies here in Washington, and the Awesome Foundation's Ann Arbor chapter. Omari earned degrees in music from Florida State University and the University of Michigan and extended his love for learning by managing the K-12 education program of the University Musical Society and by serving on the John F. Kennedy Center Partners in Education National Advisory Committee. 
and by serving as chairman of the Ann Arbor Public Schools Educational Foundation. A lapsed clarinetist, Amari now uses his voice to co-host an arts-focused radio show on WEMU-FM and recite Robert Cross poetry. Allison Watson is the director of the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs. After having served as the program's manager from 2012. Prior to joining the staff, she worked at various nonprofits, both at a local and state level, including the Michigan Association of Community Art Agencies, BSA Michigan, and the Michigan Theater of Jackson. Ms. Watson developed a passion for the arts at a young age and has worked to encourage an inclusive arts environment in Michigan ever since. Amari and Allison, take it away. Chairman Carter, uh, National Council members and guests today, uh, good morning. And on behalf of Governor Gretchen Whitmer, uh, greetings from the state of Michigan as well. We are uh, really excited to have you there uh, this summer and, um, and excited to talk to you about that today. Again, my name is Omari Rush. Um, as you just heard, I am the chair of the State of Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs. Um, I'm also the executive director of Culture Source, which is the local arts agency in, um, based in Detroit, serving about 150 nonprofit organizations across Southeast Michigan. And as it was mentioned, I'm Alison Watson, the director of the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs. Thank you all for having us here, for being wonderful hosts. Uh, I just want to mention, thinking of the presentation that you gave earlier, uh, with through our partnership grant with the National Endowment for the Arts, in our state, which is very large, we're able to serve 77 of our 83 counties with that support. Um, and that wouldn't be possible without that state partnership with the National Endowment, so thank you for that. We've been lucky the last year or so. We were able to host Tom. I don't even know if you were, how long you were on the job at that point. Very short period of time. We wooed Tom into Michigan for a poetry out loud, and I think we hooked him on our, on our great state, which uh, we had a great time getting to know him and, and giving him the experience of po his first poetry out loud. So we will claim that credit forever, just so you know that. Um, shortly after that, we were lucky enough to have Tom and Marianne, as well as Andy, join us in September, which I think at that point maybe solidified the deal on, on getting them to host their next meeting um, in Michigan. So. We are looking forward to that event, and I'm lucky enough that I have such a great chairman that I said, "Hey, we're going to do, we're going to, we're going to work with the NEA to have this event." And since you're in Detroit, guess what? How about you coordinate it, coordinate it, and you just tell me when I get to be there. So I'm actually going to turn this to give you that little sampling of what you can expect back over to Amari. And I will also take a quick moment of personal privilege um, to say that, you know, Allison just became our state, um, the executive director of our state's arts council in January. And, um, you know, it was a nervous moment for our council because, you know, we wanted um, a really great leader for the arts sector um, in Michigan. And we could not have been more thrilled to, um, to have Allison be the one that was chosen. And um, already, uh, people have been reporting back to me how excited they are about um, her just in general, but certainly her vision um, for what we might be able to do for, in general, the citizens of Michigan as well as for the arts and culture sector. So um, so having Allison as a partner is a real um, a joy and benefit for me, and um, just very excited about that. I would also say as a tiny testimony um, that, you know, we, uh, we just heard this presentation about the NEA staff, and um, I couldn't agree more about what a great resource they are to, um, to folks in the field like me. Uh, fr last Friday, I had an hour and a half long chat with Jax DeLuca about media arts, and um, got sent off in a variety of different directions about possibilities for our work. 
um, and got set up with a meeting that I had yesterday here in D.C. by her. Um, so that was great. And Allison and I, I think, spent two hours of uh, our afternoon with Michael Orlov um, and cut into a bit of his uh, conference call time. Um, but it was just such a great conversation. I think we got really inspired about having him as a partner with us in our local, regional, and state arts agencies. So um, what a fantastic, uh, what a fantastic team, what a fantastic agency. And we are beyond thrilled to have you all in Detroit with us this summer. And to kick that off, we'll show you a quick video. This is not a puppy love story. I mean, just for y'all to call my things teeth and my pain of a toothpick. Oh, this is do or die, and I do. So those were sites uh, from Detroit, what you all will uh, experience when you're uh, with us for your June National Council on Arts meeting. I certainly do have to say thank you to the Herb Family Foundation, a, um, a kind of philanthropic organization that supports many arts organizations in Detroit that we are uh, very proud to have um, in our area and proud that they produced this video. Um, so just to give you a little bit more specifics about some of the things you'll experience, we are um, we're excited to have a real celebration with you all of the arts in Southeast Michigan um, at uh, the mansion formerly owned by Barry Gordy, now owned by Alan Brown, um, commonly known as the Motown Mansion. Um, we'll have a party there to bring the um, creative and art sector together to um, to experience performances and art as, as a group. Beyond that, um, we'll see many of the projects that you as an agency have funded in Detroit. Spoken word and musical performances. We'll visit art making studios, including some hands on activities for you all that you can take home or maybe ship home. Um, your working meeting will, um, will be hosted at the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit, MOCAD. Um, so lots of hopefully inspiration there. And then the public council meeting will be at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, a beautiful facility um, and one that is being run by um, its newest uh, CEO, Neil Barclay known to many in the um, arts and culture sector as a real leader. So we're excited to have him in Michigan now. In this uh, kind of visit, we will also be joined um, with some other co-hosts who are excited also to have you all with us. Um, a former colleague of um, you all's is at the NEA, Wayne Brown, is, um, is delighted to be hosting a lunch uh, at his organization, the Michigan Opera Theater, on the rooftop, um, weather, you know, permitting. Um, and, um, and I mean, the, the views of the skyline of Detroit are just like out of this world. And so, um, so he's very proud of that. Uh, Council member Aaron Dworkin and his wife, Afa, are also looking forward to hosting you all for a reception with us. And um, we're, Allison and I are working with a variety of other 
um, of your peers in philanthropy and also um, policymakers related to the state of Michigan in, um, in helping out too. So this whole thing kicks off officially on Thursday, June 20, and we hope, and because it's happened so early, we're hoping that you might come in a, um, as you come in Wednesday, that we might just like add more things because <laughs> why not? Um, and um, in particular, we'd like to get some exposure to some things immediately outside of Detroit, um, including a visit to Ann Arbor at the um, and an outdoor community reception at the Ann Arbor Summer Festival, as well as visits to uh, organizations like the Henry Ford uh, Museum, which is known for uh, highlighting uh, American innovation. So uh, we, again, hope to um, see the entire council there uh, and look forward to helping you plan your visit uh, as individuals or as an entire body. As you're thinking about that meeting uh, this summer, making decisions of travel plans, I brought a, a small gift for the council member as well as staff. So this, over the coming weeks or month, as you're sitting back, reflecting on your upcoming plans, and you open up beverage of your choice, I hope that you will use our Pure Michigan bottle opener, and it will entice you to come visit us and spend three days in Michigan. Thank you. as well to just reflect on her time also here on the council. So, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I guess one of the perils of, of speaking later in the meeting is that some of the things that I was prepared to say <laughs> have already been said. Uh, and uh, Paul, we didn't coordinate, but I had remarks on swans as well, <laughs> uh, which I will forego. I want to start with uh, an enormous thank you uh, because it is what I feel every time I leave a council meeting. Um, it, is, uh, it has been a joy and a privilege to serve on this body with my colleagues, uh, to work with chairman and staff um, and all who comprise the agency. Um, I, I, I think it is um, challenging, perhaps, to work in a place that is sometimes misunderstood uh, and undervalued. And I was so uh, heartened and proud to hear your remarks this morning, uh, Marianne, because I think uh, you did such a wonderful job in uh, really articulating uh, true facts about how this agency operates, what it means, uh, the stewardship that has been demonstrated with such um, commitment and integrity. Um, I could not have said anything more eloquently, so thank you for that, for your leadership in that regard. Um, and my background, some of you may know, I'm, my background is not in the arts. My background is in urban planning and community development. Uh, most of my career has been at the intersection of arts, culture, design, and the integration of that into how we think about healthy places where all people can thrive. And, and I will say that that has not been an easy road uh, because in my root fields, uh, art, culture, and design, although it's getting better, um, they have not been uh, 
by default central to how we think about work, how work has to happen, or how planning has to go forward. Um, so early in my career, I um, was often challenged uh, because they said, you're an urban planner, why aren't you doing housing or transportation or environment or something more legibly urban planning? And I stuck with this idea that um, arts and culture is supposed to be central to that process. And I think that every time I uh, experience the excellent work happening from all of the, the uh, divisions within the department, um, but from my perspective, especially the design division, the creative placemaking under Jen Hughes's leadership, the work that Sunil Langar is doing in research, the work that uh, Cliff Murphy is doing in folk and traditional arts, uh, and how sometimes those are not um, clearly legible as part of what the agency brings to the table um, all around the country. Uh, and um, often also, I think, um, misunder misunderstood bodies of work that really matter. Uh, and I think that all of the work that the directors and their divisions do uh, is important um, and needs to be lifted up. I, I would want to um, affirm to all the staff that from my perspective, what you do when you wake up every day to come and do your job it is so important. It matters. You're touching lives. You're touching the country. Um, you are taking us to new heights and new places and helping us be our best selves. And it has been such a, an honor to work beside you. Um, and if I'm not back in June, partying in Detroit. Um, <laughs> I know that uh, I will continue to admire you and support you from afar and try my best to be a steward of your mission. And thank you. Uh, for that very kind introduction, Chair Carter. I also enjoyed our time together, and thank you all for the opportunity to spend some time with you here in the Capitol. I'm just proud of myself for getting over from the House without getting lost. So, <laughs> so I, I'm so grateful for the work that you do uh, here uh, with the National Council on the Arts, working with the National Endowment for the Arts uh, to uh, expand access to the arts across the country. You know the importance of the arts, um, and, and, and I appreciate that, the, the boost to the economy, what the arts do in terms of creating jobs, and, and you know, the, the, the billions of dollars in the industry, and the number of jobs is very impressive. But the arts also help us understand different people and different cultures, and give us another way to communicate with, with each other, which we need in this country at this point in our, our history. Sometimes people ask me, why do I care? Why, here I am in Congress with so many issues to, to deal with. 
Well, first of all, I have to attribute a lot of that to my mom, who was a piano teacher and an artist. Um, she's 90 years old now, and I was just recently thanking her for uh, being ahead of her time when I was growing up. And she used to paint these wild modern paintings and listen to me. We had a music room in our house. But it helped me appreciate how much being around the arts and being exposed to the arts enriches people. And so when I became an education advocate in my home state of Oregon, when my, my kids who are now grown started school, I was a parent saying, where's the art class? Where's the music teacher? Why are they, are they not having arts as part of well-rounded education? I became one of those persistent volunteers in the classroom. Um, at one point, my son said, Mom, do you always have to be at school? But to me, it was so important to get that message across that, that our schools provide a wonderful opportunity for students. If they're missing out on those enriching experiences, that's a problem. When we see students in their classrooms, and, and I represent one-fifth of the state of Oregon, and I serve on the education committee, so I, I visit schools a lot. And you can see, it is, it is obvious that when students have exposure to the arts, when they're engaged in the arts, they are, um, there's more joy in their learning. There are more creative outlets given to them uh, to express their individuality. So I, I serve on the education committee, and I know Chair Carter mentioned the STEAM caucus, and sometimes people say, what's that? So I serve on the education committee and the science committee. And I've been on the science committee for more than seven years, and on the education committee for more than six years. And when I first joined those committees, we were having a lot of conversations about science, technology, engineering, and math, and how important STEM is, and those STEM jobs. And then I get out into the real world, and I speak with employers, and nobody ever said I'm looking for a really good test taker. They would say things like, we want people who, who can come up with new ideas. We want people who can work on a team. We want people who can collaborate and communicate about the work that they're doing. Those are the kinds of skills, especially as we're looking toward the jobs of the future, but nobody was talking about how do we educate students to be creative and innovative, because those were the words that I was hearing in the workforce. So that's where STEAM came about, integrating arts and design into STEM learning. And the students shouldn't have to choose, and, and this is especially true with young girls. There's a gender gap, and girls don't think they're good at, at science and math, um, but oftentimes they think, well, I'm good at art. So integrating arts and design into STEM has been a, a bipartisan effort. We got a piece into the Every Student Succeeds Act, which is the leaving behind, no child left behind, and putting less focus on test scores and more focus on well-rounded learning. We have seen in schools that are using the STEAM approach, definitely more inclusive environment uh, and uh, more diversity in the students who are uh, interested in, in science and technology and engineering and math. And, and, I'll, and I'll tell you a story. Uh, when uh, former Chair Chu came out to Oregon, uh, I took her to a couple of nationally recognized STEAM schools that happened to be in the district I represent. Not because I'm the co-chair of the STEAM caucus, but because it was a peer-reviewed study. And at Potama Elementary School, which is a public school in Hillsboro, Oregon, we met um, two girls who, who were in sixth grade, and they stood in front of the then chair of the NEA and their member of Congress and a whole bunch of grown-ups and explained the stop-motion animation film that they had made to communicate about cell division. And so it wasn't just that they could understand cell division, it's that they had made the film to explain it and then they could narrate it because they had um, that approach of integrating the arts and design and communicating their learning. Um, another school, Highland Park Middle School, um, also a public school in Oregon, the entire school uh, participates in activities like they did beautiful mosaics of the seven wonders of Oregon where every student, students with special needs, all the way up through their high achieving students um, participated in, in these activities that help them express their creativity. So I will continue to support arts education, including important funding. I've been leading the effort to fund the Title IV grants under the Every Student Succeeds Act uh, to make sure that more students have access to that well-rounded education that includes the arts. We, we have a bipartisan letter now. It's, it's appropriations time, so we have a bipartisan letter with more than 100 supporters for that 
funding for well-rounded education. And we'll continue to work with the Department of Education to see how the states are using those dollars as intended for that well-rounded education. So um, I also wanted to talk about how I mean, this bipartisan effort has been wonderful. And I had a thought um, just a while back. Uh, the Library of Congress occasionally hosts um, dinners for members of Congress. And it's one of the things that we do where we sit down together bipartisan, we listen to authors, it's all funded through philanthropy, so your tax dollars are not paying for dinner, but it gives us an opportunity to, to really get to know each other and to talk. And so this particular night we were listening to Ron Chernow, and he was talking about his book about Grant, but he was also talking about the book he wrote about Hamilton. And so it dawned on me thinking about how here we were with this bipartisan group celebrating this this author who was an English major, uh, who wrote this very uh, successful book about Hamilton that of course then became this incredibly successful, talk about the economic impact of Hamilton and all the jobs, but also look at all the people who are learning history and look at all the people who might not ordinarily listen to music that's inspired by rap and hip hop. Um, and so you have the combination of the, the, the theater and the history and the music and the storytelling but the message that I got from it is that's wonderful, but you shouldn't have to be able to afford a ticket to Hamilton to be exposed to the arts and the lessons that it learns. And that's where the National Endowment for the Arts comes in because NEA-supported projects can be found in every single congressional district in this country. And so it's not an urban rural issue. These, you know, the, the funding is across the country and that is what's so critical in expanding access. And every dollar, you probably already know this, but I like to emphasize that every dollar of NEA funding leverages additional nine dollars, did I get that right? Yes. Uh, of public and private funds. And we see the benefits um, in our communities across the country. So I have been and will continue to be an enthusiastic supporter of the appropriations uh, request to fully fund the NEA, and we have had success over my, my relatively short time in Congress in preserving, preserving it and sometimes slightly increasing that funding because it is so important, uh, the work that you do. So thank you, thank you for all you do to make the arts more accessible uh, to everyone in the country and also for helping to make sure that the next generation is passionate about the arts. Thank you again. Thank you, Congresswoman. And I should note, thank you, the, um, the two girls in sixth grade that the Congresswoman mentioned who uh, created the movie on Cell Division, we actually invited them and they came and spoke at a national council Wonder. meeting in March of 2017, I believe it was. So members of our staff will remember that. And it really was pretty dynamic. I'm proud of my constituents. <laughs> <laughs> thank you again. Thank you so much. As our final piece of business, I am pleased to announce that the National Council on the Arts has reviewed the applications and guidelines presented to them, and a tally of the council members' ballots reveal that all recommendations for funding have passed. Are there any additional comments, questions, or discussion from the council members? The 196th meeting of the National Council on the Arts is now adjourned. Thank you.